Next talk is uh, the speaker is Van Lauten. Approximation and almost periodicity. Please, will be offline talk. Is there chalk? Uh, oh, yeah, there's chalk. Uh, is there more white chalk? Uh, maybe a white one? Uh, oh, great, great. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. <coughs> okay. <coughs> okay. So, so, okay. I'd like to thank the organizers for the uh, kind invitation to uh, w uh, participate in the wor workshop here. Um, so, Basically, there's two topics I'll talk about that are somewhat related. Uh, the first four uh, references here, uh, you know, either published or and they're all on the archive. So I'm not going to talk in too much detail about those. And they have to do with spectral factorization and some relationship with entire functions of one variable. And uh, the, the this topic here, I'm not quite done with the, the paper, but uh, I'm more excited about those results. Uh, they have to do with uh, characterizing certain classes of almost periodic sets, subsets of Rn, and uh, related with uh, quasi-crystals, and, uh, and especially with something new called Fourier quasi-crystals, which are of interest in both algebraic geometry, number theory, and physics. Um, so, okay, so, and yeah, these are some my papers, but the ref many of these papers have references uh, who uh, uh, containing results uh, I'll uh, mention today. So, um, so basically, it goes back to 1915, Fair conjectured and Reese proved that if you have a, uh, say, a one periodic uh, uh, non negative trigonometric polynomial, then it's equal to the squared modulus of another trigonometric polynomial. So, you, you have a Laurent polynomial, you know, and if it's real valued, it's, it's uh, closed under complex conjugation. So it means that every root inside the unit circle, a modulus less than one lambda, corresponds to a root one over lambda conjugate. Uh, and if the, it's not only real valued but non-negative, the zeros on the unit circle have to have even multiplicity. So it's obvious uh, from the fundamental theorem of calculus how you construct the spectral factor S. And S can be constructed in such a way that all the zeros are, uh, are no zeros inside the open unit disk. Uh, and that's called an outer uh, factor. Uh, now, in uh, 1950, uh, and, and you'll see, of course, that the, the Laurent polynomial that's non-negative will go from a negative frequent n to a positive n degree, right? Whereas the spectral factor goes from 0 to n. So the bandwidth is exactly 1 half the bandwidth of the original polynomial. Uh, in 1958, using uh, prediction theoretic methods that were pioneered by Karl Magoroff, Wiener and Masani, uh, Helsin and Lodenslager uh, generalized this from the unit circle group to an arbitrary uh, compact abelian group uh, whose dual uh, admits a, uh, a Pontryagin dual admits a linear order. And those are, though every group that's connected has that property. Uh, so, and uh, so what you can there, you can replace the positive polynomial with any uh, non-negative function whose logarithm is uh, integrable. And, uh, and then you can express uh, the p as the modulus squared of a function in the Hardy class that's square into an h2 Hardy space. That's an outer function. Now, you can't characterize outer by not having roots, but Burling had a very clever way of uh, characterizing outer. Uh, so um, now every Archimedean order on G corresponds to a dense embedding homomorphism uh, of R into G. Uh, and uh, you know, the biggest kind of G that you can have here is the Bohr compactification, which is the Pontryagin dual of the discrete real numbers. Uh, now, um, now it turns out if P is a band limit, uh, now if P is band limited uh, basically means that the uh, if you compose the p with uh, sigma, 
you get a Bohr almost periodic function with a bounded spectrum. Uh, now, I conjecture that in get that case, the band limit of the spectral factor is equal to one half the band limit of P. Uh, so, uh, uh, now, at first I tried this on Z2. So, the Z2, the linear orders on Z2, which is the Pontryagin dual of the T2, uh, just correspond to rays. If the ray is rational, you have a lexicographic order. If it's irrational, you, ha you correspond to an Archimedean order. And uh, so they have a certain topology. And this was easy, my conjecture was easy to prove in the case of a lexicographic order. So what, what I said, if you have a non-lexicographic order, you, are, you, can, you, you approximate it by lexicographic orders, by rays that approach it. And if, it could, if you could approach fast, so if your slope uh, was irrational in such a way that can be fast approximated by rational numbers in a way that I think Lane uh, characterized, then I was able to prove this. But it's a very, very lousy proof, <laughs> very clumsy. Uh, not worth reading, really. Uh, that's sort of one. But in number three, uh, th this is just on the archive. I never uh, didn't publish it. But uh, they basically, I was able to prove this easily. And I did that by relating the spectral factor s. But then if you compose with a psi, you get a, uh, you get a nice function on the real line with a band limited. So it, it extends to an entire function of exponential type. And you use a easier spectral factorization. Or actually, in this case, it's bounded function. So you use uh, an earlier result of crying. Uh, and, uh, and, and this, uh, we proved that if the, uh, yeah, another paper I showed, that if you have uh, P as a bounded uh, spectrum, uh, and then you can pull it back to the real line or, or not, or anything else, then the log of P is an LP. So it's, uh, this means that you're, if you take a Bohr almost periodic function that's non-negative uh, and non-zero and take the log, that's going to be Besikovich almost periodic of, in all LP classes. So some nice things. For instance, the Hilbert transform maps LP to LP for P bigger than 1. Uh, OK, so let CB be the C star algebra bounded continuous complex value function for the soup norm, soup, soup absolute value norm. T of R is the, uh, generated by trigonometric polynomials. I can write it like this. And uh, the uniform closure are the uh, uniform or Bohr almost periodic functions. 1925, uh, you know, Bohr proved that the, uh, these functions have a, a mean. And defining this f hat function, it's not really the Fourier transform, but it acts like that, is the mean. And then you get a formula. And then the spectrum of the set where the f hat does not vanish. And that's countable. And uh, you get a formal expansion of this type. But what it means is that f is uniformly approximated by polynomials uh, you know, with uh, these frequencies in the spectrum. And uh, that those polynomials, the, the coefficients uh, turn out to be these f hat. They converge to f hat omega. Um, a uh, chi is just a character, a, a Pontryagin character. A chi sub x maps the real number y into e to the i x y. So it's just a homomorphism into the circle. Uh, yeah, that's a complex conjugate, right, right, right. Uh, so uh, and uh, so we we can talk about the band limit is the uh, soup minus the inf of the spectrum, and that could be infinite value. But if it's finite, then we say that function has finite band or band a bounded spectrum or band limited in, in electrical engineering terminology. So um, now Bohr also showed that uh, a, a, a almost periodic function will extend to entire function of exponential type if and only if the spectrum is bounded. Uh, in 1932, he proved a, a deeper result, uh, it, not in the series of Octa papers, but in a different journal. Uh, he said, if you have an almost periodic function whose modulus is bounded below by some positive number, uh, then there exists a constant c and an a almost periodic function phi such that the argument of h has the form cx plus phi of x. Now, th this would be the mean, the mean uh, periodicity. And th this came up in early in celestial mechanics. How does you know, different bodies rotating around other ones, what's the mean oscillation? Arnold discusses that in his book on classical mechanics. Uh, now, 43, Krein proved that if you have a function of exponential type uh, and uh, 
bounded on the real axis and non-negative, then it emits a spectral factorization, where this uh, function s uh, uh, extends to an entire type, uh, a function s of exponential type having no zeros in the open half plane. And the uh, exponential type is half that of f. And s is unique up to multiplication by a constant modulus 1. So an Ahesier extended that result to a larger class of uh, entire functions. So um, now in 1949, Krein and Levin announced and outlined a proof for the existence uh, uh, of the following. If m is, uh, OK, of an m that's positive, an f uh, that with a bounded spectrum uh, larger than, of course, f is real value, uh, larger than equal. So it was translated into English only in like 65. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, and, uh, but they also proved that if you, uh, th th these coefficients are absolutely summable, then the spectral factor is uniformly almost periodic and it has spectral things. Uh, but they didn't say whether that's a necessary condition. And, uh, okay, maybe, maybe I'm speaking well. Oh, uh, okay, I can speak in here. Okay. Or fine. OK, so, um, so in 4, uh, we proved some uh, preliminary re result here. Uh, lemma 18, th I find this kind of interesting. If you have a, um, a function h that's, uh, in, uh, in whose reciprocal are both uh, uniformly almost periodic, and uh, their spectrum lies in non-negative real numbers, so they're in the Hardy space. Uh, and the modulus squared of h has a bounded spectrum, then h itself has a bounded spectrum. And if you sh frequency shift h, you get the spectral factor of f. And number uh, 20, uh, another result. If f is uh, uniformly almost periodic with a bounded spectrum, uh, f is bigger than some positive number m, you let g equal 1 half log f. You let u be the Poisson integral of g. And you let v be the harmonic function conjugate to you in the uh, open upper half plane, then uh, v is, uni is not uniformly continuous, but it's uniformly continuous on every horizontal line. It's hor universal, uh, I mean, it's uh, uniformly continuous on every vertical line, and therefore it extends to a uh, continuous function on the, on the real line. And, um, and uh, it turns out that, you know, then e to the uh, I times one half U plus IV will will be a spectral factor, but when is that going to be almost uh, uh, uniformly almost periodic? So uh, theorem one, you define the F U and V like we did before, and you let H, H, H equal X. Uh, I'm sorry, you don't have to take one half. I took it already. U plus IV and uh, H is uh, the restriction to the real line. Then F has a spectral factor that's uniformly almost periodic if and only if the argument of h, which is the restriction of v to, to the real number, has the form in equation uh, 1 that Bohr uh, derived, right? So it, it looks like basically a linear function perturbed by a, a, an almost periodic. Yes? Do you remind the, the equation 1? Yes, equation 1. Uh, what was that? Uh, this one here. This is the, yeah, this is Bohr's uh, famous theorem here, yeah that answer the little celestial mechanics problem, right? Uh, OK, so um, yeah. And the theorem, too, uh, we show that uh, there exists a uniformly almost periodic function uh, with bounded spectrum bounded away from m. That does not satisfy 2. In other words, it's not absolutely convergent. But yet it has a, a you know, spectral factor that's not almost, yeah, not almost periodic. So anyhow, so the idea was to start with a thing on the circle, and then you, you uh, form the, uh, you know, like the series sine for some n equal one, two to infinity of law of a sine n x divided by n log n. That's in the t uh, the uh, book on uh, the famous uh, Zygmunt, uh, Zygmunt's book on uh, Fourier series. Uh, so uh, that that obviously is not uh, absolutely convergent. 
uh, and his Hilbert transform blows up. <laughs> you know, it's not nice. But anyhow, so you take a sequence of Fayer approximations to that, and then you take a subsequence of that that converges super fast, and then you take uh, Qn is uh, the nth term minus the n plus one minus the nth term, and then you and then you uh, form that series, and now those spectrums are, are spread out, but then you dilate them and bring them back into a compact area by a series of dilations that are rationally accountable, num accountable infinite number of dilations. You shrink them back into, a, into a, a finite interval. And that'll give you a function on the finite interval that's not absolutely summable, but uh, you know, it has band limit, it's, band it's bounded spectrum. Uh, so uh, I, I think that's it there. So I want to talk about more exciting thing. And, and then I, I modified that argument so that you can actually make the spectrum have rank two group to be fit on a torus. And then I created stuff on the, on the torus, for instance, where if you uh, take a, you know, th this Archimedean order, and then you, uh, you have a function that's continuous, but the a Fourier transform, uh, and with bounded spectrum uh, of rank two, the spectrum's in a rank two subgroup, uh, but yet the uh, Hilbert transform blows up. So, so that's based on you know some geometry and some uh, Minkowski geometry of uh, convex sets and all kinds of stuff. So how how do I switch to the other paper? Now th this is just a work in progress. I hope to get it mounted on the archive and then Ten include minutes, it. Uh, Ten minutes. Oh, okay. So I'm going to go through this kind of fast uh, uh, and and just do some pictures. So I'm I'm going to skip a lot of stuff. Oh, I want to consider. Uh, a bunch of, you know, some points, uh, gamma, inside Rn. And uh, these points, uh, Tharkov calls these uh, Bohr almost periodic. Uh, well, associated here, you can form a, a measure mu, the sum of delta functions at lambda in here. OK. So Bohr, I mean, uh, Tharkov calls this Bohr almost periodic if, uh, if you take mu and can involve with a function of compact support, then you'll be Bohr almost periodic, right? You'll be Bohr almost periodic. And he calls it Besikovich almost periodic set if this convolution is in uh, you know, the Besoff, uh, some Besoff space here. Here you're taking a, a uniform limit of, OK, so a uh, uniform limit of polynomials with the uniform. If you put a weak LP uh, topology, uh, then, uh, then, uh, then you get the, co the completion becomes a Besoff, I mean a Besikovich almost periodic. So anyhow, in these cases, uh, so uh, but another way of looking at it is now. Now I'm interested only in the case of the Bohr almost periodic sets where this is a uniformly discrete. So the minimum, the infimum of the distances between points is bounded below by a positive number. And, uh, and if it's almost Bohr, then, then you're going to have a synthetic set, you're relatively dense, so you're going to have a DeLone set. A, a DeLone set. OK. So I'm going to assume that this is DeLone and Bohr almost periodic. And then a toral type, what do I mean by that? I mean that the uh, spectrum, I can talk about the spectrum of this, because I can talk about the Fourier transform being a, uh, well, it's a radon measure and it's a uh, tempered distribution. So it has some, and if it has a, <laughs> as a tempered distribution, it's a sum of delta functions. So let's put it that way. Okay, so it has has an expansion, and if this spectrum fits in a rank m finite subgroup of of R n, then we're going to I'm going to call it a toral type, a toral type. Now, if it's a toral type, what we're going to have is the following: we're going to have a compactification psi into the an m-dimensional torus, a product of unit circles, right? And, uh, and this is going to have some nice properties. But anyhow, now this mapping, because this is, has nice topology, it lifts to a function, uh, I'll call it m, to the universal cover of this, which is rm. And we have, of course, a canonical homomorphism. And uh, now this thing is easily shown to be uh, there's a continuous, but it's also easy to show it's, uh, it's uh, continuous. And the only continuous homomorphisms into Rn are linear. So M, this mapping M is associated to a, uh, a matrix, um, a matrix uh, uh, over Rm of size uh, M by N, whose rows are rationally independent. And that's in order to be dense, 
those rows need to be rationally independent. Now what I do is I take this the lone set lambda and I map it under psi uh, into a set here. And then I take the topological closure in here. What does that closure look like? That closure is amazing. Here, here's why. The closure is a union. Uh, th this, this closure, what do I call it? Uh, yeah, th this, uh, I call it K, is the closure. So K is a union of connected components. Each connected component, each connected component is homeomorphic to an M minus N dimensional manifold. And it's embedded, it's embedded into TM in such a way that if you take uh, pi 1 of i and take uh, and this maps the fundamental group the fundamental group of uh, kc w w w uh, of kc into the fundamental group of tm that this uh, the image uh, of course this is homeomorphic to i mean this is uh, this is the group zm minus n and this group, of course, is Zm. The image of pi 1i is rank, a rank m minus n subgroup, is a rank s minus n. So this uh, image is a subgroup s, right? Now, I take s, and uh, this s is equal to s times a z to the m minus n, right? OK, now this may not be a projective subgroup. It may not be a direct complement, right? So what I do is uh, I projectify it like this, projectify it. So what you do is uh, you, you write the group. Um, you take this matrix, multiply by r to the m minus n, and then uh, intersect that with z to the m. This is a projective subgroup. so. The ZM is a ZM is equal to this plus some other group of rank uh, a free module of rank uh, ZN, where E of course is a uh, is an integer matrix M times N. Now you can derive this thing. The E matrix is easy from the Smith normal form of the matrix S of the matrix block S. Right, easy to get. Now, and here's the, here's the breakthrough kind of. The density of psi inverse of the connected component, a KC, the density of this, because the lattice, the original lambda here is a union of these lambdas here. I call it irreducible sublattices. The density of this is nothing but the modulus of the determinant of this here times the determinant of E transpose the matrix M. OK, this matrix here. OK, Okay. so we have an exact formula. And now we have to add this up over all the connected components. And we'll have a formula for the density of lambda. Now, let's do it when n is equal to 1. When n is equal to 1. Now, when n is equal to 1, uh, things become very simple. This m is just a column vector, right? And we interproduct it with a row vector. And, uh, we can, uh, and, uh, but now we have a beautiful result of uh, Tishmarsh that says the, the density of zeros in the complex plane, we have an exact formula for that. And if you normalize this uh, vector, uh, this m is an uh, is a, is a m by 1 matrix, so it's a vector. And if you normalize it to have length 1, Tishmarsh says the density of zeros in the complex plane is the width of the Newton polygon in the direction of this unit vector. Right? So if that's equal to the density from this formula, it means that the density along uh, the real line of lambda, the zeros, oh, OK, now, if lambda is a zero set of a polynomial, so it's an algebraic variety. And uh, this would say that the density of the zeros of this, of this uh, function here uh, is equal to the density uh, on the real line. The Tishmarsh density is equal to the density of the zeros on the real one. Well, that means there can be no zeros off the real line. Because if you had a zero off the real line, 
by almost periodicity, it would occur, you put a little circle around it, that occurs within bounded gaps. And by Rouchet's theorem, you know, you have an infinite set of zeros occurring with positive density, so the density would be bigger. So it turns out those two densities are equal if, you have, if this uh, set, the, the k, the closure of the, the compactification of, of the uh, Delone set, if that thing uh, it, it has a density, uh, uh, and it's an algebraic set, if it has the density equal to the Tishmarsh density, uh, that means that uh, that that um, the, the the polynomial, the restriction of that, you know, you get a zero set, and that's a polynomial on the torus. So when you restrict it to the embedded line, you get a trigonometric polynomial with no with all real zeros. And uh, since these these things are embedded in the torus transverse to the foliation, your your zeros are simple. And uh, now there's a uh, based on uh, extending the work of Mayer, uh, Yves Mayer, and uh, Sarnock and uh, Kurtisov, his, his colleague, uh, they've been working on stable pairs of poly uh, multidimensional polynomials that, that come from Li Yang theorem and uh, uh, quantum graphs and things like that. Extending that, uh, th th uh, they were able to prove that a one dimensional uh, like lambda, one dimensional, uh, the Fourier transform will will have a discrete a spectrum that doesn't have limit point if and only if those are zeros of a trigonometric polynomial that has no that has simple roots and no roots off the real axis off the real axis so now i'd like to to now they sorry enough all these people they use these one dimensional contour integrals so they they, they take contour integrals and, and they count in different ways motivated by guinard vial theorem about the zeros of the zeta function so uh but how do you, it's not easy to how, to, how to generalize that to multiple dimensions. What's the analog of Tishmarsh theorem for multiple dimensions? So uh, my, my uh, department chair, uh, August Seek, uh, is, is an expert on multidimensional residue. So maybe we can in investigate that aspect to try to extend this, this result of Olyevsky. Uh, our, our, he's a Russian uh, Mathematician I met a long time ago after I gave a talk on the Catterson Singer problem in St. Peter uh, in uh, St. Petersburg at the Euler Institute decades ago or a decade and a half ago and uh, I met him and uh, he teaches in Tel Aviv we, we have the correspondence hmm? Olyevsky. Oh. Olyevsky. Uh yeah 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 Alexander Olyevsky. yeah uh -huh. <laughs> yes right right yeah. You did? Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He and his wife took me around St. Petersburg Pushkin uh, Cafe there, and uh, it was really very nice to see him again. Okay. Uh, questions? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Uh, maybe I have a question. Yeah. You mentioned, uh, you mentioned uh, some result by Crane and Levin. In the beginning, yes, yeah, and you said that this is gives sufficient condition, but it is not. Uh, it is. Uh, it's. It's not known whether it, it's. Uh, well, necessary. they don't say whether they. They just don't mention. It. They don't say that this is necessary or sufficient. Yeah, but, or uh, it, but it just occurred to me yeah, that. Yeah, but uh, what can you say now? Is it, is it necessary or no? Not? No, 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 because uh, I constructed an example okay. where the spectral factor uh, is periodic, the but, but the point, blows yes. up. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Other questions from the online audience? No questions? Thank you once more again.